Okay, so what do you need? Besides a miracle. Trains. Lots of trains. Whoa. Is that Engage? Hello everyone, and welcome to episode 4 of my Engage layout build. We've been working on a small layout that will fit on a windowsill or even a bookshelf. It is an Inglenook shunting puzzle, so it actually has some operational interest on a baseboard that's really tiny. So far, everything is functional, so we can run trains, move the points, and we've got magnets for decoupling, but we don't have any scenery. So in this episode, we're going to start tackling the aesthetics and begin building up the landform. So we've seen this image before in previous episodes. It's the layout plan made in the AnyRail planning software. The eagle-eyed among you may have already spotted that I'd written some notes on this image, and taking a closer look at them, you'll see that I was planning out what the elevation of the layout would look like. If we begin in the rear left corner, we've got the tunnel, which will obviously require quite a steep incline to get the earth over it so that it's actually a tunnel and it's under the ground. If we look now at the front left and all the way across to the right we have a large area of fields and I want the land here to fall gently away towards the front of the layout so that we get a nice view of the trains as they go past. On the right to break things up a little bit we'll have some fences and sheep for a little bit of visual interest and I went ahead and made a small modification to the original plan and I've added a small pond on the left hand side. So I've just scribbled in a blue area to represent that for now. The idea is to try and uh, break up the grass from looking like a horrible green carpet from the 70s and Having the pond will also give me an opportunity to practice using epoxy resin to simulate water, which again is a, another technique that I've seen on YouTube that I'm keen to emulate. Finally, in the top right hand corner, we have the goods yard. This comprises the converted engine shed that we saw a little bit in the last episode, and that will sit on a small gravel area probably with some die-cast cars or lorries placed down as well. So, that's the plan for what everything is going to look like. What techniques are we going to use to actually achieve that? Well, as the base is made from foam, we'll just shave a little off of it towards the front to form the fields and the pond. So we're not going to add anything, we're just going to sand down the foam we already have. And for the industrial gravel area, we're just going to leave the foam as it is in terms of its height. So it's just going to be a, a flat area there, and obviously we'll add some texture and some color to it. The main bulk of the actual landforming we need to do is around the tunnel area. And for that, we're going to use plaster and foam to build up the height of the land. So let's start by taking a bit of material off the foam. This is done very easily just by using a piece of sandpaper in a sanding block and just rubbing away at it until we've got the shape that we like. We're starting with a bit of a sharp corner and we're basically just slowly removing material until that becomes a bit more of a gentle curve. It's pretty easy to modulate how much material is coming off just by how much pressure you add and the foam actually sands down really nicely and you end up with a very smooth surface. So we've just sanded down the front of the baseboard and we're starting to get a little bit of shape into the layout. Now that we've done the sections where we are removing material, we're going to look around the tunnel area where we're going to start adding material. 
The product I'm going to use is something called Sculptor Mold, which is a paper-based product and it turns into a thick paste when you add it with water and then you can add it to your layout and shape it to your heart's content. The issue is it doesn't hold its shape uh, in its initial form once you've mixed it up, uh, so you need something to retain it. And particularly around the tunnel area, the Sculptor Mold is going to be on top of the baseboard and unless I surround the baseboard in something, that means the modeling compound is just going to run off the edge and make a horrible mess. So I had to make the tough decision to surround the baseboard in wood panels to hold the plaster in place, which unfortunately means all of those coats of Vents blue paint have gone almost entirely to waste. But, um, oh well, you live and learn, and once again we've found out another lesson about planning ahead it seems like the baseboard is an area where I got it wrong multiple times and paid the price. But oh well, um, now the decision is made, let's get cracking. With that said, I decided to clad the baseboard in plywood. I first cut it out roughly with the circular saw and then offered it up to the baseboard and marked it with a pencil, as you can see here, to get closer to the final shape I wanted. Once that was done, I could come in with a jigsaw and cut the majority of the material off. But I did leave a little bit extra just so that once everything is glued on, I can sand it back to the exact shape I wanted to take into account any kind of tolerance in the gluing process. And as you can see, it was a nice day, so my furry friend decided she would supervise me during this task. So here's the four pieces of ply once they've been cut out, arranged around an image of the layout plan. As you can see, the highest point is going to be in the rear left there near the tunnel, and the plywood sidings are much lower towards the front and the right. One other thing to note is also the cutout for the electrical connector bezel, the small piece I 3D printed in episode one. And once again, I'm very pleased that I bolted that in rather than glued it because it's now been out and back in three times. Here's a bit of a sad sight. I don't want any visible fasteners through my side panels, so I'm going to bond them on with PVA. The glue won't stick very well to the smooth paint that I spent oh so long getting just right, so I've come in with some sandpaper and roughed it up which was very painful considering all the time that went into that paint job. Oh well. I've also come in and uh, removed the brass inserts as they're going to get reinserted once again, this time into the plywood. So now we're going to bond on the side panels with PVA following the usual process. One thing to note here is that I'm only bonding on the two longer panels for now. And that's because of my woodworking skills not being the most accurate in the whole world. I'm struggling to get any better than plus or minus one or two mil on my cuts. So what I've done is I've intentionally left the long sides with extra material, with the idea being once I bring in the shorter sides, I will sand these down and then I'll have nice flush ends on my baseboard. The shorter sides were also cut a little bit long on the circular saw and then slowly fettled in with a file and sandpaper to get the fit really nice. Here you can see the tunnel side end panel being offered up as a dry fit and you can see that there are no gaps on either side and the fit is actually good enough that I can take my hand away and the panel holds itself up. Once I've done this for the tunnel side, the same was repeated for the right hand side panel. One quick thing before we actually glue the tunnel side side panel on, is we're just going to use some black paint to paint the surround of the tunnel mouth. I don't think it will be visible, but uh, just in case, the black will blend in a lot more than the relatively bright beige colour of the plywood. So let's get these side panels bonded on. 
We haven't had any super speed in a while, so let's crack that out and watch the panels go on. Once again, we're just spreading the PVA on, smoothing it out with a piece of scrap plastic card, and then deploying some weights to hold it in place while it all dries. After leaving the usual 24 hours for the PVA to dry, once we take another look at the baseboard, you can see the extra material left on the long side panels. That's the stuff I was talking about earlier that's going to be removed once we're a little further into the build. Despite feeling like I was in a somewhat semi-abusive relationship with the blue vents paint, I did think it was going to end up looking nice. However, I don't think I'll miss it too much, as seeing the layout clad in its plywood, I think once we've got a coat of varnish on there, this is also going to look pretty cool. And if we get our eye down nice and close to the baseboard, the plywood is actually giving us quite a good impression of how the land is going to lay once it's all done. I'm pretty happy with it. I don't think it's going to be too steep, which is something I want to avoid. I don't want it to be cliffs, I want it to be a kind of rocky hill face type deal. So yeah, I think it's looking good for now. So now our plywood cladding is up. Um, unfortunately, we've had to say goodbye to the lovely painted baseboard, but as I said, I think the plywood is actually going to look pretty good, so I don't feel too bad about it. And with that groundwork done, we can now look at the exciting part, which is adding in the sculptor mold mixtures to, to start building up the landform. We're going to do this in two stages, the first of which is going to be adding in some of the pink foam, which we used to top the um, baseboard and we're just going to build up the rough shapes with that and then the second stage is going, going to be bringing in the sculptor mold mixture to make the final landform shape. I was a little bit worried about the plaster sculpting compound leaking onto the track from around the top of the tunnel area so I began by using some DAS air dry modeling clay to blank this off. I swiftly squeezed a small sausage shape sufficiently to cover the full arc of the tunnel and pressed it into the corner between the card of the tunnel itself and the plywood end piece to make sure it was sealed up nice and tight. Next, I started adding in some foam pieces to build up the rough shape of the land. I'm not gluing anything down at the moment, I'm just cutting it and chucking it in there loosely to get a feel for where all the pieces are going to go. The area in front of the tunnel is pretty steep, and I'm keeping in mind that I want the final plaster landform to be lower down than the tunnel retaining walls, so I'm not building up the foam too high here. I followed a similar process for the area at the back of the layout behind the tunnel, here I use some long triangular pieces to get the rough shape of the sloping hillside as it drops towards the track. The foam was then glued down with PVA. I wasn't being too careful with the position of the foam blocks here as they're really there just to build up some of the bulk and the plaster is going to go on top and define the final landform. As we have some pretty steep elevation on the layout, I decided to add some rock molds. I got this little silicon mold tray and some hydrocal plaster from my local hobby shop. Hydrocal is a plaster product used to make castings because it holds an awful lot of surface detail when placed into a mold. Here I'm adding roughly two and a half parts hydrocal to one part water to create the mixture. You probably want to be a bit more accurate in terms of your measuring than I'm being here, but I've actually already made the rock molds and this little video is just for demonstration. You want to give it a pretty good stir and then once it's ready, it's going to look a little bit like thick pancake batter is the best way to describe it. I'm periodically adding more plaster until the paste looks how I expect it to. 
and once it's ready to go it's simply a case of pouring it into the little tray and be careful not to make too much of a mess. As with anything where bubbles may be a potential concern, it's always best to start your pour at the lowest point and allow the material to fill up from there rather than starting high up and potentially trapping air underneath the mixture. And this goes for anything from this hydrocal to resin pours or even polyurethane pours. The hydrocal does have a little bit of surface tension, so once you've poured it all in, it's worth coming back and teasing it around with a stirrer or something similar just to uh, allow it to spread properly onto the mold. Another thing to keep in mind is that you can't pour the leftover hydrocal down the drain as it will block your drain, so keep a spare tub handy to pour the waste into and get as much of it into the bin as possible. Once you've poured your hydrocal rocks, they're going to go hard within about 30 minutes to an hour, but that doesn't mean they're fully set, and if you try and demold them from the silicon tray in that time, they're almost certainly going to crack. You need to leave it at least 24 hours before they're fully set to actually try and break them out. My advice would be to put them somewhere out of sight so that you're not tempted because trying to resist opening these things up early is like Gollum trying to resist the one ring. So put them somewhere out of sight and then wait at least 24 hours. Once the hydrocal is set, it's time to come in and remove the rocks. Take your time with this and do it super slow because it's very very easy to crack them and in fact I do crack some of the larger ones trying to get these out so the key is to just take your time and don't rush it. And once they're out, you can see just how much detail the hydrocal pulls through. I'm really, really impressed with the texture of these, and you can see how well they're going to take paint from the dry brush because all the little ridges are going to catch the paint and allow us to have a nice variation in colour across the rocks. And with the rocks done, I arranged them on the layout quickly just to get a feel for where they're going to go. In some areas, particularly around the pond, I trimmed the foam so that the rocks could sit lower down rather than being so high above where the land is. And I'm hoping this is going to add a nice bit of variation in terms of the land so that it's not just all covered by static grass. Now onto the main event, making the sculpt mold. This stuff is another product that we mix with water, but don't get it confused with the hydrocal. They're very, very different compounds. We're gonna mix this stuff up until it's a horrible sludgy mess. It's exactly the kind of thing we all love playing with as kids and making the most amount of mess physically possible. It needs to be mixed until it's kind of like wet play-doh I guess is the best way I could describe it. It should hold its shape but definitely not be dry. I would definitely recommend mixing this stuff in a disposable container. You can see I'm using an old milk carton and that's because it's another product that shouldn't go down the sink so whatever you mix it in just let it set in there and then condemn that container to the shadow realm. This is where the fun begins. Now it's time to actually start applying the sculptor mold to our layout and forming the shapes that are going to define what the railway looks like. Out of the mixing pot, the sculptor mold starts off very, very malleable and you've got a lot of control over what the final shape will look like. But I was surprised at how quickly this stuff starts to harden up. 
For this reason, I would suggest mixing up quite a small amount at a time if you're doing something relatively small and detailed, like my little N-gauge railway. Otherwise, it will dry rock hard before you're finished with it. Apart from that, I was surprised how easy this stuff is to work with. With the foam blocks in place, it's simply a case of smushing the mess down into the spaces between the foam and on top of the foam, and from there it holds its position pretty well. I worked down the front of the tunnel first, and then ran along the back of the pond area, integrating the rock molds as I moved across. The rear of the layout was a little bit more tricky, mostly due to the shape of the land being more complicated, steeper, and having more rock molds to place onto the steep face that faces the track. In hindsight, I would have placed down less plaster to begin with, positioned the rocks on top of this layer, and then added a second layer of plaster to sandwich the rocks in. The way I tried to do it was by getting the land where I wanted it, and then trying to push the rocks in. But in reality, as the sculpt mold starts to set quite quickly, it was too resilient for this and the rocks ended up sort of sitting on top of where I wanted the plaster to be, to be. Despite this, I did manage to get them smoothed in reasonably well by adding small bits of plaster here and there, but I ended up making more of a mess than I would have liked and in particular ended up getting plaster on top of the rock molds and obscuring some of the details. The top tip here is to always finish with a nice wet finger and rub it across the mounds until you're happy with the result. Again I'm surprised by the sculpt mold and it actually can give you a very smooth finish just by this simple technique. I am incredibly pleased with how this has turned out. The land is nice and smooth and undulating, and the rock moulds look like they naturally belong on the land. Having a very detailed plan here, both written down and in my head, definitely helped as I could focus on using the plaster to create the shapes I had in my mind, rather than making it up as I went along and trying to do it on the fly. I think the cliff face in particular towards the rear of the layout is going to allow for some nice colour variation as there are a few rock molds there sticking out of the land. One thing I would have done if I were to do this again would be to mask off the card of the tunnel. I ended up getting a fair bit of plaster on this and it was difficult to remove in the moment and now that the plaster has begun to set it's essentially impossible to get rid of. However, I think I will be able to cover the white plaster with paint so that it's not too noticeable. So now the landform is all shaped. We have built up the area around the tunnel, incorporated our rock moulds, and I'm pretty happy with how things are looking. Unfortunately, the plywood around the baseboard is still looking pretty rough. Uh, this was something I'd planned. I intentionally left it a little bit long with the idea being I was going to come back and trim it to exactly where the plaster was. So I had to leave the plaster for like three or four days. It took forever to dry. But once that was done, I came back and began neating up the plywood. I started off by focusing on the areas with the plaster and to remove material from the plywood sides here I used a sanding drum fitted to my Dremel tool. I had to be pretty careful because the sanding drum, even on a low speed, absolutely chews through the plaster and the plywood, so light pressure here was essential. But using this did mean I could make pretty swift progress and I could also follow the shape of the plaster a lot better than if I was using a big wood file or a rasp or something similar. I was actually pretty surprised at how well the sculpt mold sanded. It um, didn't peel away or chip or anything like that, it 
sounded nice and smooth, uh, even with a relatively coarse drum. Once the air around the tunnel and the rest of the top edge of the plywood was trimmed, we had to deal with the extra material I had left on the long sides of the baseboard. So I came in, first of all taking off material with the Dremel tool, then working my way to a rasp and finishing everything off with some sandpaper to get it super smooth. It's actually surprising how good of a finish you can get here, considering how bad my cuts are. Just putting in a little bit of elbow grease can get you a nice result and it's super satisfying to run your thumbnail or a ruler across the gap and see that it's perfectly flush. Now that the plywood sides of the baseboard are looking nice and neat, the final stage is to come in and add the holes for the threaded brass insets. I'm not going to show the full process here, but I worked through the usual stages, starting with a small drill bit about 2 or 3 millimeters, and working my way up to 7 or 7.5 off the top of my head, and between each stage countersinking the hole to prevent splitting of the plywood. So that's the basic landforming and new plywood sideboards complete. We can see here the way the plaster is built up around the tunnel and the plaster rocks that have been blended in. There's a new sense of density here that doesn't really come across well in pictures and it's hard to put into words. Really you just have to get up close to the layout and get your eye down low to get a feel for it. Looking at the railway from a little further away, I actually think the new plywood sideboards are going to look pretty good once they've been varnished and they're a bit of a darker colour. I am sorry to see our lovely blue vents paint covered up, particularly considering how many attempts we had at it, but such is life I guess. So thanks for joining me for episode 4 guys, we've um, began working on the scenery which is very exciting and for next episode we're going to start looking at adding in some of the foliage and other details such as static grass and other things. So I hope to see you for that one and I'll catch you next time. See ya.